Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing committee, it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to the sixth Leopoldo Garcia Colin Mexican meeting on mathematical and experimental physics. As you know, the meeting first held in September 2001 is fostered by a group of uh, professors of the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana at Iztapalapa campus in collaboration with El Colegio Nacional. El Colegio Nacional is uh, like a Mexican Academy of Science and Arts and Professor Luis Felipe Rodriguez will explain us uh, more specifically what is Colegio Nacional. Uh, the meeting begins today and it is uh, the sixth edition and it is dedicated to the memory of our teacher, advisor and friend, Don Leopoldo Garcia Colin, who passed away already three years ago. The main objective of, is to open new lines of research for young Mexican scientists and promising graduated students. The meeting consists of five plenary lectures and three parallel symposia. The Leopoldo Garcia Colin meeting medal lecture and a public lecture. Each of the parallel symposia consists of 10 main lectures before noon and 20 short talks in the afternoons. On Thursday afternoon, there will be a visit to the Templo Mayor Museum and the opportunity to visit also the wall paints of Diego Rivera uh, with the Mexican history inside of uh, the National Palace at the Zócalo, very near to this venue. This edition of the meeting will consist, as usual, of three symposia. The first one is Approaching Black Hole Hidden Horizon, which uh, will be here at the Aula Mayor, and will be dedicated to celebrate the sixth, sixth, uh, sexy uh, birthday of Professor Klaus Lemertzal. The second symposium is uh, Quantum Frontiers, and will be in Aula 2, and the third one is uh, concerns with experimental and applied physics, and it will be at uh, Aula 3. Uh, this edition, Professor Hans Jürgen Stockmann from the University of Marburg in Germany will receive on Friday evening the honor of the Leopoldo Garcia Colin Medal for his outstanding contributions to the field of quantum chaos. The former medal winners uh, are, in 2001, Professor Nicolas van Kampen from the University of Utrecht for his contributions to the field of statistical mechanics. In 2004, Professor Michael Dove from the Imperial College was awarded uh, for his contributions to the field of unified field theories and strings. In 2007, Professor Victor Marquez from the National Institute of Health uh, for, uh, got the recognition for his valuable contributions in cancer research. In 2010, Professor George Weiss, also from NIH, got the medal for his outstanding contribution to the fields of biological and chemical physics. In 2013, with some difficulties, but we succeed to deliver the uh, medal to Professor Klaus Lemertzal from the University of Bremen in Germany for his contributions to the field of confrontation of gravitational field with experiments. We will finish the meeting with the closure and a honor wine with tequila and mezcal. I recommend you to remain to this uh, closure. We want to thank Professor Luis Felipe Rodriguez and the crew of El Colegio Nacional 
for uh, this uh, marvel, the opportunity to use this marvelous venue, and for their efforts and contributions to the organization of the meeting. We also want to thank all the speakers for your help to continue with the tradition of this Mexican meeting. Thank you very much. Now I invite uh, Professor Luis Felipe Rodriguez to tell us uh, what is Colegio Nacional. Thank you very much, Alfredo. Uh, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I'm an astronomer. I work for the National University of Mexico, and I am a member of this uh, Colegio Nacional. W what is the Colegio Nacional? It's an institution that was funded in 1943 by then President of the Republic, Manuel Avila Camacho. The idea was to support, to facilitate the teaching, popularization activities of a group of uh, Mexican scientists, uh, scholars, and artists. And then uh, that's what the Colegio Nacional has been doing over uh, all these years, uh, more than 70. It is, it is indeed a, a design sort of following the lines uh, of uh, things like the National Academy of Science in the U.S., although I think that the National Academy doesn't help much the, the members, but more like a, a, a Le Collège de France, which is this institution that you know has these French scientists, and uh, they are supported to do all sorts of, uh, of interesting activities. Um, with a, a, one of the very distinguished uh, members of the Colegio was Leopoldo Garcia Colin, and uh, uh, as uh, Alfredo explained, some years ago we started having a meeting when Leopoldo was still alive, then he died a few years ago, but we have tried to continue the meeting. This is the sixth uh, meeting, and uh, we are very happy to host it here in the, uh, audit in the main auditorium of El Colegio Nacional. Uh, and uh, we will enjoy these facilities. Actually, El Colegio Nacional will also offer a light lunch for all of you, which is also important. And I really enjoy that. that, that I really expect that you enjoy the, the venue, uh, the downtown of Mexico City, full of very interesting places, museums, and, uh, and historical sites, the city, and, and of course, the meeting, and that this uh, is a very productive meeting for all of us. Thank you very much. Now I invite uh, Professor Leonardo Dacduc to tell us who was Leopoldo Garcia Colin. Well, I want to start just thanking the organizers and Alfredo for this kind invitation, and uh, because it's very nice to say some words about my my friend and uh, former advisor. Well, um, Leopoldo Garcia Colin, born in Mexico City on November 27, 1930. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from the National uh, University of Mexico in 1953 and in, phys in physics one year after. His thesis dealt with the thermodynamics properties of deuterium and hydrogen deuterate as part of the project whose leader was Alejandro Medina. He obtained his PhD at the University of Maryland in 1959 under Elliot Montrell's supervisor. By the way, uh, Elliot Montrell was very famous because of, was a really nice physicist, but also because uh, he has 16 kids. And um, well, in the University of Maryland, uh, Leopoldo Garcia Colin began his dedicated career as a teacher. Returning to Mexico in 1960, he faced the very hard duty of constructing total new research groups in statistical physics and thermodynamics. This was an exhausting task demanding time, effort, and insight in the development of high-level education institutions and government laboratories with a solid scientific basis. His research interests encompass many areas of physics and chemical physics like statistical physics of non-equilibrium system, non-linear irreversible thermodynamics, kinetic theory of gases and plasmas, phase transition, non-linear hydrodynamics, and glass transition. 
He's author of more than 240 research papers, 20 books dealing with thermodynamic, statistical mechanics, not equilibrium phenomena, and quantum mechanics. His textbook on classical, classical thermodynamics is well known in Spanish-speaking countries. Along many years, beside the fields previously mentioned, his scientific interests spur important incursions into the biophysics, transport theory, in astrophysics, and cosmology, air pollution problems, science policy, and educational research. He maintained a continuous correspondence with many scientists and traveled frequently all over the world. He was active member of various prestigious international societies like the Third World Academy of Science since 1988. He was an enthusiastic supporter for books editing and conference organizer, such as the Mexican Meeting on Mathematical Experimental Physics, which started in 2001 and is already its sixth edition. He was founder and professor of physics of the Escuela Superior de Física y Matemáticas at the National Polytechnic Institute. Subsequently, he went to the Universidad Autónoma de Puebla and then to the science faculty of the National University. He was researched at the National Institute for Nuclear Research and thereafter he became head of the Processes Basic Research Section at Mexican Petroleum Institute. In 1974, he started the Department of Physics and Chemistry at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, Campus Iztapalapa. Among his extra academic activities for Professor Garcia Colin was a loving husband and father, dog people, excellent teacher, girlfriend, and the best advisor. He was a vice president and later president of the Mexican Physical Society. He was an active member of the American Physical Society, the American Association for Physics Teachers, the Mexican Academy of Science, and the Mexican Chemical Society among others. His work was recognized through several honors and awards, among them the Physics Award for the University of Maryland, the Prize in Exact Science by the Mexican Academy of Science, and the Merited Medal from the University Autónoma de Puebla. He held the Van der Waals Chair at the University of Amsterdam in 1976 and received the National Prize of Science and Arts from the Mexican government in 1988. Professor Leopoldo Garza Colin became member of the Colegio Nacional in 1977. His opening talk, Modern Ideas of Liquid Gas Transition, was answered by Professor Marcos Moschinsky. His scientific and teacher career was also recognized by degrees of Dr. Honoris Causa by the Universidad Iberoamérica in 1991, by the University of Puebla in 1995, and the National University of Mexico in 2006. In 2007, Professor Garcia Colin became Emeritus Professor at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana Campus Iztapalapa. Leopoldo Garcia Colin shared passed away in Mexico City on October 8, 2012, but he always be present in our lives. Thank you. Now I invite uh, the head of the physics department uh, of the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana Campus Iztapalapa uh, to uh, deliver some words and later on to declare open the works of this meeting. Thank Jose you. Luis Hernández Pozos. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, as a head of the physics department at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, it's for me a great, very, very pleasure to be uh, here welcoming you. Uh, I hope we all will have a very fruitful uh, meeting. Uh, we will enjoy all the talks. We will learn more about uh, all the different aspects of physics in which we, each of us is not a specialist. Um, just to um, complement what uh, has been said previously, uh, as, as you know, this is the sixth uh, version of this meeting. I think we can say by sure now, now is a tradition at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana. And uh, we really want to uh, thank uh, the people from the Colegio Nacional to foster this, these meetings, and we hope we can still do it in the future. Um, the, the, main, the main aim of this meeting is, is to fold it. It's about uh, giving to our um, uh, graduate students and final year uh, 
undergraduate students, a glimpse of what is people doing uh, in physics around the world and, and in the main specialties uh, and the main fields of, of physics. In that sense, in all this, the fifth, uh, five previous uh, meetings, we have had a really um, complete look at what is, the, what is modern physics. Um, and apart from that, from, from the uh, staff from Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana and other institutions in Mexico City, it's a very great, it's a very great opportunity to meet uh, uh, people and, and establish new collaborations. Uh, in that sense, uh, I, I hope that the students who are here, and hopefully will be a lot more in, the, in, uh, uh, in, in this week, will learn a lot of, about you, and we will all make new friends. Um, I just want to say that uh, we have been privileged in having, as is this time, a very um, distinguished uh, researchers in physics. Uh, so, some, sometimes we have, we have had several Nobel laureates here. And uh, finally, I just want to say, probably uh, Professor Macias already said that uh, yesterday when you arrived, but uh, we offered a very uh, warmest welcome in, in this, uh, in, to Mexico City. Hope you enjoy the meeting, hope you enjoy the, the, uh, the, um, the environment around here. Uh, if you see a lot of people, especially today, it's not uh, sadly because they, they like physics, it's because a very popular songwriter died last week. Uh, they, they, there will be a, um, a, a yeah, ceremony uh, to, to offer him, but this is nice. It's, it's part of the of the Mexican culture and Mexican floor call. You you could enjoy. You could, you can enjoy it here. So, not not to make this longer. I want to to declare uh, as this day, 5th of September. Uh, the works of the sixth Mexican meeting on mathematical and experimental physics at the Colegio Nacional uh, inaugurated. And I, I hope we all will enjoy physics. And let's start to talk about we all like physics. Thank you very much. Then we make a break and we'll continue with the talk of Professor Ruffini in five minutes. Okay, let's begin with the talks of the meeting. It is a pleasure for me to introduce you, Professor Remo Ruffini. He's well known in the fields of gravitation, relativistic astrophysics, and cosmology. He is a founder of the International Center for Relativistic Astrophysics, ICRA. And his talk today uh, is from supernovae to hypernovae to binary driving hypernova. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, I give the microphone. Alfredo, thanks you, thank you very much. And uh, it's always uh, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm um, representing ICRANET in, uh, with the city in Pescara, Nice, Rio, Rome, Yerevan. And we have recently opened also another center in uh, uh, Bielorussia, in Minsk. And of course, we have the two traditional seats in Stanford and uh, in uh, Tucson. I will uh, speak today about um, uh, Professor Narayan, who is one of the fathers uh, of the field on uh, GRB, tells me, tells me we are starting with a bang. Well, very likely we'll do that. Therefore, don't uh, expect anything traditional. Or, uh, let's go to the point. They are four different systems which are really the pillars of uh, relativistic astrophysics. 
supernovae, neutron stars, black holes, and GRBs. And these pillars are really independent on each other. The relativistic astrophysics stand on them, and there is relation. And uh, it's exactly on the relation, some recent, very recent one, of these four different pillars constituting the basic of relativistic astrophysics, which will be my talk. Supernova are the best known. If the, in the history of planet Earth, it's very likely the supernova the best studied object in the history of humankind. It should have a mention special of collaboration between the Eastern world without prejudice in 1054, the uh, impossibility to look at the sky due to a religious aspect in the, in the West, the opening of Korean and Japanese to the reality of the discovery of what was then known as Gestar. And then, of course, everybody knows the continuation from Messier later on to the uh, work of Oppenheimer and the school, Oppenheimer Wolkow, and uh, uh, all the way later uh, to the observation of the supernova of the crab, which is still expanding today at 250 kilometers per second in this beautiful picture of the space telescope. But it's not only thanks to the fantastic data which we have, and there are still big discovery to be done in the CRAB, but uh, the, the other pillar re fundamental of um, uh, relativistic astrophysics, which differentiate relativistic from astrophysics from different field of physics, is the fact that this field is based on very, very solid theoretical work. Relativistic astrophysics has the guidance of uh, Einstein theory of relativity, but has inside the idea developed by Enrico Fermi in the beta decay analysis and also in this set of fantastic paper of uh, Heisenberg and Euler about the quantum electrodynamics of very strong electromagnetic field leading to electron-positron pair creation. Is this the basis of this uh, field, which uh, is different from other field? The style needs uh, theoretical understanding and then that analysis. There are other fields in which they don't look very much, they don't have this fortune of having a theoretical background, and they just go phenomenological in uh, establishing power law and then uh, checking chi-square and then obtain whatever they can get. But relativistic astrophysics is not so, it's starting with a theoretical background. So much for the, uh, for the uh, crab, and the neutron star is the next step. Neutron star, of course, were uh, discovered after the Crab pulsar, and this uh, uh, observation by actually two students in, uh, uh, in uh, two graduate students in Tucson, and uh, here there is the, this beautiful set of pictures, each one a millisecond apart, in which this companion star appear and disappear, and it's fantastic, this uh, simple, clear example of uh, an object uh, emitting 10 to the 37 hertz and pulsating with 33 milliseconds, and from the slowing down, thanks to the work of Arrigo Finzi, to evidence the origin of rotational energy of a neutron star in a pulsar. Therefore, this is the second concept. It was uh, exactly when uh, I went to Princeton in 1968 that John Wheeler dedicated to me this uh, 
picture where John Wheeler is represented in the garden of the institute with uh, Yukawa and uh, Einstein. Actually, Naresh, there is uh, a jacket there. You see a piece of a jacket? If you, <laughs> if you see the original picture, this was a Baba. Anyway, this beautiful picture was given to me and represent Wheeler, Einstein and Yukawa. And was John Wheeler who really set the launch in, uh, uh, for the discovery of uh, another op, 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 for the discovery of uh, a third object, the black hole, uh, in this uh, uh, in this work which we did in 1971, introducing the black hole. Therefore, the three objects, the neutron star, the, uh, uh, the black hole, and then uh, the mass formula of black hole with uh, Dimitrius Christodoulou. And uh, all this physics uh, about the neutron star and the black hole, which is too well known, okay, was really announced by the launch by Riccardo Giacconi of the Uru satellites and the discovery, finally, of uh, the first neutron star uh, orbiting a main sequence star in Senex 3, giving evidence of the measurement of the mass of the neutron star for the first time, and the companion observation still made by Riccardo Giacconi with the Huru, that indeed there was a Cygnus X1, a much larger star with an object close by emitting a huge amount of energy of the order of 10 to the 4 times the luminosity of the Sun with a mass larger than 3.2 solar masses pointing to the existence of the first black hole in the galaxy. And this was where the time that the recognition came to me in 1973 for the identification of Cygnus X1 and later on a mo much more prestigious one, uh, 2002, to Riccardo Giacconi for uh, the Nobel Prize for the final uh, uh, observation with his uh, Uru satellite, his mission of, the, of Cygnus X1. This is an enormous success. And uh, at the same time, the neutron star allowed another great, great discovery, the binary pulsars. It was again a professor at Princeton, uh, Joe Taylor, who observing the signal of uh, a binary neutron star could uh, show the discovery, the clear discovery, of gravitational radiation due to the binary nature of this neutron star. And we had also the pleasure to, ce to celebrate this discovery at Varenna in 1975 with Riccardo Giacconi, myself, Tony Hewish, and Joe Taylor, and uh, uh, Subranaman Chandra Seca, who, and the, the book which came out of that school is still uh, memorable. But the last member of this great discovery came from Gamma Ray Burst. The way they were discovered was absolutely not planned, was accidental. Actually, the accident was generated, though is, is not recognized usually and not well documented, but was due to indirectly uh, to Yakov Borisovich Zeldovich. Because <laughs> Zeldovich, in order to show the superiority of Soviet Union and his own work on the atomic bomb with, uh, um, with Sakharov, had the idea and the rocket he had helped to develop, 
He had the idea to send a rocket to the moon and have an H-bomb explosion, and at a given time from half of the Earth to look up uh, for the um, Russian uh, reaching the moon. It was, of course, absolutely cancelled, uh, not even to discuss about. But it was fundamental because the idea was presented and the American put in orbit the Villa satellite in order to make sure that nobody on the Earth or on the Moon will violate the non-proliferation agreement of the atomic bomb. And that has been exactly from this satellite that after they were launched into orbit, just after they start to see in three of the satellites, the satellites were omnidirectional and was necessary to have four in order from the arrival time with the atomic clock on board to localize, not precisely, but to localize the general direction of arrival. And uh, it was soon after that these were the first data published in 1974 when uh, uh, Jan Strong presented there our, our meeting in San Francisco that they were explosion, very, very similar to the one of an atomic bomb. But they were not from the Earth. They were not from the planet of the solar system. The accuracy was enough to make sure that they were not coming from the solar system, but they were known from nowhere. And in these days, we were very excited about this discovery. And just after the meeting, we, with Thibaut Damour, with a good friend of many of you, and at the time he was visiting me at Princeton University, we wrote a paper that quantum electrodynamical effect in a kernium angiometry could originate the gamma ray burst by electron positron plasma. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it was paradoxical because the energy we predicted had to be 10 to the 54 erg, and there was no evidence at the time for their existence, or the, this distance. Uh, the story goes, uh, now let me go a little further, uh, with the Batse telescope, who localized many of the sources uh, of uh, GRB in short and long, and then there was the epochal work of the Italian uh, Dutch satellite Beposax, which thanks to the uh, positioning in the X-ray and in the gamma ray for the first time, a new concept, bridging the gap between the gamma ray astronomy and the X-ray astronomy, discovered that the GRB were not only sudden emission lasting a few seconds, but they discovered that they could last 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, up to 10 to the 7 second afterglow. And it was exactly the afterglow which allowed the starting of a new era, more satellite, Swift, Fermi. But what has been essential is the collaboration between Vela, initially Compton, long and short, uh, Beppo Sachs, which gave the afterglow, and the key point of the synchronization with the optical telescope of Mano Akea, and especially the VLT, the possibility to find the distance of this gamma ray burst and understand that indeed the energy we predicted with Thibaut Damour was precisely order of magnitude correct, 10 to the 54, and their cosmological origin. This is history, but still worthwhile to mention. And let's go now to, well, of course we were conscient that we were a presence of a new situation in the universe. Here is the, and this is a delicate point, here is a blue line which looks at the space-time diagram of our solar system. This is the epoch of the Big Bang. These are our light cone. And what you see, the majority of these gamma ray bursts 
are originating much earlier than the start of our planetary system. Therefore, it's the first time that we are looking for the first time astronomically, astrophysically, to outside the solar system and our, our solar system, but all the way very close to the region of the Big Bang, which has been hypothesized the Big Bang by the work of Fermi and Gamow, and observed by some of the people at uh, Murray Hill and also at Princeton, but let's not go in this detail. I mean, dear, dear, I'm just writing a book on this situation and clarifying the great contribution of Fermi, Heisenberg, Einstein, and also mentioning some historical fact about the discovery of the... And let's go back to the gerby. I said four pillars, independent, neutron star, supernova, GRB. But then we were sort of ready to understand that uh, GRB originated from the formation of the black hole. Supernova give origin to neutron star. But then something special happened in 1998, and slowly the message became stronger and stronger and stronger and motivated a new era in astrophysics. This is the discovery of 98425, a GRB, and a supernova occurring in coincidence pra practically. How could it be that a GRB thought as originating from the black holes, could simultaneously happen with uh, a supernova. Something was uh, drastically wrong in our understanding, in our theorizing. I will, uh, I will not spend too much time on the details, but uh, just uh, emphasize about some work which had been done by Freyer, Wusli, Hartmann, and Otter, but which uh, we did not know at the time, but was extremely interesting, speaking about evolution of two massive stars and uh, in, uh, in their evolution. They consider many possibilities. Unfortunately, they missed the key one about the many possibilities they considered. And this, finally, we work together with uh, Chris and our group. By the way, this is Chris signing the wall of our uh, Icranet Center in Rome. We have many people who signed the wall, visited, and uh, many of them later, after signing, got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I will. But not all. It's not sufficient to sign to have the Nobel Prize. There is a good statistic of correlation, but you cannot have the Nobel Prize just because you signed the wall. I mean, Chandra did uh, successfully. Zeldovich did, but did not get the prize. And uh, Tuft did the week before the prize. That was successful and so forth, but not the topic. Something also very, very important was done by the Japanese who discovered the hypernova. A hypernova is a neutron star, is a supernova much more powerful than a supernova. Instead of 10 to the 49, it can go up to 10 to the 52. And this is the, the case of the uh, study done by uh, Kenichi Nomoto in Japan. It was based on this mixture of fact that bit by bit our theoretical approach, which is finally uh, coming to fruition in these days, was developed. The paradigm of the inverse 
uh, induce gravitational collapse. This was actually hypothesized with two, three other papers in 2001 in APJ letters. One about the paradigm, space-time paradigm of uh, st space-time paradigm of gamma ray burst. Second, about the way the electron-positron plasma could create uh, the prompt radiation. And third, the fact that necessarily it must have uh, happened that uh, under a very small uh, set of circumstances, a black hole formation was uh, occurring almost at the same time of a supernova explosion, and vice versa, the supernova could eventually induce the formation of the black hole. This was our third letter in 2001, but nobody or very few people realized that at the time of this necessity, but still is there. And the, and the general approach started using the knowledge that uh, it was gained in the meantime. One of the fundamental knowledge which uh, in the meantime developed and is today of great uh, necessity and attention, needs attention, is the fact that the, practically the totality, 95 or 98 percent of massive stars around 120 solar masses are binaries. And this was totally unexpected at the beginning. But this is the key point, that this object, like Eta Carina, in this object by the, uh, by the uh, uh, VLT, uh, this beautiful picture, are binaries with orbital period of 5.5 years. And uh, the two stars have to evolve. The more massive evolve faster. The less massive evolves also later. And therefore, in our picture, it became almost mandatory that a system like Senex 3, which has uh, a binary period of 2.5, one day is relatively short, is just the evolution of a binary system of this kind in which the more massive star has gravitationally collapsed and uh, undergone a neutron star formation. And the companion star, reducing its mass, is still accreting matter in, uh, in the neutron star remnant. But then, uh, if this is the case, that two massive stars evolves, the more massive evolves and form a neutron star, the less massive one starts itself to evolve. And this object is the one of Senex 3. Actually, there are more possibility which we are examining today because we have much, much more information. And I am talking today only about our understanding dating back in the historical work of Nomoto, his group and others, of this uh, evolution. This therefore is no news, and this was also considered by Chris Freyer and uh, Wosley and so forth. But the key idea which we introduce in the IGC binary pro, pr, uh, project is that the neutron star can be so close that hypercritical accretion can occur and as the supernova explode, as a function of the distance, the transfer of material on the neutron star can be as high as one solar mass per second. 
This was unthinkable before. They were matter transfer, much lower rate. But here we were wit witnessing, due to the distance of the order road, only of 10 to the 11 centimeter up to 10 to the 10, of a massive transfer as the supernova explode on the neutron star. And this physics is totally new in a certain sense. It was studied uh, by Jim Wilson and myself in 73. Jim proposed that uh, accretion like Cygnus X1 or Senex3, they are very low rate, but in principle not think, uh, avoid the possibility to have accretion much higher rate if the neutron star is closer by. We are not this idea at the time. We just propose that for high accretion rate, neutrino emission could be essential, and the new stage of hypercritical accretion was dominating. 1973, we published. I remember going to Moscow. Uh, I was going to Moscow every six months, roughly, to discuss a beautiful discussion with Yakov Borisovich Zeldovich, and as I gave him this paper, he said, Zeldovich said, well, let me return to you the same paper published by us. And uh, we were really a uh, thinker, far, not applying directly. But again, the physics uh, of neutrino emission pioneered from the supernova by uh, Gamow and Schoenberg was so attractive that this object gave us the opportunity to have work a process not just by a millisecond, but for seconds, tens of seconds. And this has been the work with Rueda, by the way, uh, Rueda is Colombian, one of the youngest professors in uh, Ikranet by Itzo and myself, and finally, all this uh, uh, theoretical uh, imagination and uh, uh, order of magnitude estimate was tra transferred to Los Alamos, where Fryer verified all this on this uh, huge amount of computing time and uh, uh, and uh, verification of idea. This has been a fantastic adventure. And in the same spirit, I show you this uh, fantastic result made with uh, 10 million particles of uh, trajectories of a supernova explosion with nearby a neutron star. <laughs> this, I like so much this picture that we have made a poster I will leave you a few examples. But believe me, this work is really, truly uh, uh, fantastic. It was done by our group with the, uh, Laura Becerra, a young uh, student from the group of um, Rueda, coming uh, uh, from Bogota, and she managed to have the patience of uh, the doing this work. But let me explain you the work a little better. If you have a supernova explosion, the supernova is emitting matter spherically symmetric. But this near the border of the supernova, there is a neutron star nearby 
this neutron star accretes much of the material, and the binary period of the neutron star is comparable with the time of emission of matter from the supernova. This is the key point. Therefore, for a while, everybody before thought that an explosion of a supernova should unbound the system due to the proximity of the neutron star to the site of explosion of the supernova, a large part of the material does not go out, but accretes on the neutron star and form a black hole. And somebody could ask, but who is this object here? This object here is the most beautiful, part, equally beautiful part of the story. This, neutron, <laughs> this supernova, of course, create a new neutron star. Therefore, we have the supernova, the old neutron star becoming a black hole, and the new neutron star created by the supernova. Is that dream, or it can be incorporated in the experimental data? This was, uh, came out from experimental data. Here you have the accretion part of the binary, here you have the GRB emission, and here you have the new physics, totally new and fantastic, of the afterglow. And this is, uh, there are huge amount of work going on. I will not touch on this, but this system are, we baptize them, we give a name, binary driven hypernova, because the hypernova is driven by the accretion of the supernova into the neutron star binary. Today, it's Monday, 5th of September. And I will just change topic a moment to celebrate that in, in two hours time, there will be an Astro PhD paper which has been accepted the day before yesterday eh? in uh, in uh, uh, ast astrophys uh, astrophysical journal. And this shows another part of this induced gravitational collapse. Is the case of GRB 090510, in which of having not a supernova with a neutron star, a binary driven hypernova, okay? Leave that part for a moment. I stop on binary driven hypernova. I go to a different system in celebration appearing today. Is the fact that uh, you can have another induced collapse of two neutron stars, and I think Narayan was one of the first to be interested, if I'm correctly, on the binary neutron star idea, no? And, <laughs> and this is the, now the, what follows. You can have not just uh, a, a main, uh, excuse me, I repeat, a supernova exploding in presence of a neutron star, but you can have also two neutron stars going around shorter, merging, and forming a short GRB. And this system is really fantastic. It took eight months, <laughs> I'm laughing about it, it took eight months of refereeing, because uh, it was difficult to appreciate the novelty. It's difficult, and I will mention why there is difficult. But here you have a two neutron star, and again, one of the big difficulty is that the people doing the analysis, like the Fermi team 
wo die die Analyse auf die Source 09.05.10 just to look at the data. They look at the data, they have a real time, they have high energy, they have X-ray, they have gamma ray. Okay, splendid data they have, splendid data. But they don't allow the theory to come in. And therefore, they analyze all this system within a framework, very delicate point, in which a GRB is just a jet coming out from a single system and having a, a COMT, inverse COMT, whatever, blah, 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 blah. and then put all this together in a machine, they give power law, they apply chi-square and they obtain whatever. It cannot be done like that. It's necessary to make a space-time diagram of a process. And if you make a space-time diagram and you observe the thing here at infinity, now I refer to the triple group of theorists of general relativity sitting in the audience and also to Alfredo, the time-space diagram means that here is the GRB emission on the light cone, the prompt here, lasting a millisecond, but then there is another energy here, which is not coming out from here, it's coming later, and this is the gem radiation. <laughs> and this has been the key point that the gem radiation does not come together with the other radiation. But you need something that they have not been thinking. They have not been thinking about a space-time diagram which localized the different part of the system. And uh, here is uh, our current analysis where you can explain the spectrum and all that. And what is more exciting is, uh, well, I put this together last night. Please go back to the paper. But there is uh, the JEV emission, which is common to all the sources, short and long, and uh, having uh, the hypothesis which we present here, you will see this in the paper tonight. But the key point is that it comes, this emission, from the rotation of the black hole and the Jev emission comes out here, not there, not there, and it's the first time that we witness in real time the birth of the black hole. And the birth of the black hole is, emit, is the Jev emission. This is the new message. It took quite a long time to convince the referee and completely uh, different from what has been up to now. Uh, observed. But again, I have not the time and not the duty to, to annoy yourself with uh, some too technical data, but still I want to mention you. What is the difficulty in understanding all this? Again, you need history to understand why it will be so difficult to understand this sort of physics and astrophysics. And uh, I would like to explain how different is the point of view from the traditional GRB uh, community uh, approach. Uh, I, I, I think I remember one of you when I came here last time asking, but where is the jet? Uh, in the traditional picture, it's a jet, okay? The picture is much more complex, but let me go back to the general idea. This everybody should think about a moment. When uh, Enrico Fermi did uh, the study of the beta decay, I'm still in time to spend a few minutes on this, he presented the theory after a, a ski uh, a vacation in the mountains of Italy 
to his group of collaborators, including Segre, Pontecorvo, Amaldi, and a few others. Everybody was excited about the neutron going in proton, electrons, and antineutrino. They were excited. Uh, the review, Nature, which received the paper, was not so excited because it refused to publish. But anyway, but the point that they were very concerned, the colleague of Fermi in the Rome group, was, well, so we understand that the neutron go on proton, electron, neutrino, but where were the proton and the electron and neutrino before? And it took some patience from Fermi to speak about second quantization and explain that exactly in an atom you have a transition on the electron in the orbitals, you have the, the emission of a photon, which just occurs in that process. Today, this is familiar in particle physics. You have, for example, electron and positron going into mu plus, mu minus. Nobody is uh, concerned about this. Adone, uh, the big accelerator, even at CERN, you have the formation of Z and W and whatever starting from quark, anti-quark. And the characteristic time scale is in and out the S-matrix approach which was conceived by, very likely, by Wheeler, not modest enough, modest too much, not to acknowledge that his idea was presented and uh, then followed by authors. But the S matrix goes an instate, a characteristic time which is due to quantum fluctuation, and an exit in two different systems. The same difficulty which was encountered in quantum physics is today in front of the astronomer. Because here we have an FACO core going a supernova and a neutron star companion not having a quantum transition but having a characteristic uh, evolution less than 100 seconds and forming a new neutron star and a black hole. This is uh, absolutely astonishing for an astronomer and from an astrophysics. It will be very, very, very hard to accept. The fact that the gamma ray burst thought to be simple because the only thing is that was short one second, 100 seconds, was done by astronomers, not by physicists. Physicists understand that the characteristic time does not mean anything short or long. It means short or long with respect to a characteristic time. Not short and long. And second, 100 seconds. Yes, maybe for somebody in everyday life, 100 seconds is short and so forth, but it's not necessarily simple. And now that we understand the physics of this, which we call cosmic matrix, in which you have the first one, neutron star with CO core going new neutron star, you have a, a, a wealth of system, like neutron star and neutron star, going the, the, like the preceding one which comes out today in Kern-Newman black hole. But you can have neutron star and neutron star not going in a Kern-Newman black hole, but in a massive neutron star, like we discussed this morning. A neutron star CO core going, uh, going to a, uh, uh, not going to the black hole, but to a massive neutron star. These are the X-ray flash. These are the BDHN and so forth and so on. And you have the, the, what we taught before, the GRB, as a simple system. They are a scenario, an arena of relativistic astrophysics. And you have, uh, uh, this is just to give you an idea, an idea of this uh, family. 
in which you start for, for uh, two massive stars and then you have all this evolution. But never mind, it's not so simple because out of this evolution, this other evolution can start and after this evolution, this other evolution starts. We are living in a astrophysic uh, scenario, unprecedented in beauty and verifying Einstein theory and all the other fundamental theory. We have the fortune to have uh, a group of young but very, very powerful collaborators. Orger Weda is professor at Ikranet, is a Colombian origin. Uh, Milos is, oh, I cannot say <laughs> which nationality has, because he's not Croatian. They told me that he was Serbian. I tried to say that he was Serbian. He became very upset because within the Serbian community, he's a minority of the Serbian community, not to confound the, with the other one. Okay, he became very excited. You see, he's always on the verge of being excited about the, uh, He discovered uh, Giovanni Pisani, the Pisani relation, and uh, here we have uh, Muccino, and uh, uh, the, uh, one of the youngest uh, from uh, Uzbekistan. And uh, again, uh, another uh, group picture I added with uh, Carlo Bianco, uh, Wang Yu, uh, fantastically bright student, a supernova from China, and uh, of course, uh, Orge Rueda, and, uh, and here also Izzo was the sign now to go to observe from Spain this observation. So much for the, this presentation. I have still a few minutes, but uh, I would like to, see, to say a few words at least about some general uh, aspect of why I think GRBs are so fundamental and supernova. But the supernova GRB uh, black holes, they are part of a new uh, reality, which is just being open, and follow in the next day some additional paper coming out. I think the most exciting thing was something we thought with Peace in Chen. Why nature should need gamma ray burst? Why? I mean, they are fantastic machines why they are needed. How the universe will be different within, without, let's call this family of uh, uh, neutron star black holes, one family, is that radiation is very important to stimulate genetic change. If they were not GRB, I want to tell you this dramatically, we will not sit as homo sapiens within this room. If we are not the acceleration of gamma reverse radiation, change in the genetic will not happen. And the fact, in my opinion, that gamma ray bursts are so widely distributed in the universe indicates that, uh, very likely, life is all over our universe and needs this uh, effect. Before closing, I was asked to give uh, a, a few statements which um, I will formulate in the most appropriate neutral w way but it's a very delicate situation, let's put it like that. In 1968, when uh, I arrived in the United States, uh, Wheeler was uh, in, the, in Maine, in his island, uh, and uh, Eduardo Maldi insisted that I look very much to Joe Weber's experiment on gravitational waves. 
Well, Amaldi was very keen to to develop this gravitational wave search. And um, I contacted Stanford and uh, I convinced them to try to go one step further in uh, verifying that um, Weber was uh, not correct. The reason I was sure that Weber was not correct was again that with John Wheeler we decided to compute for the first time the cross-section of a gravitational wave of Weber type. We even published a book with uh, Martin Rees, Gravitational Wave Cosmology and Black Holes, Gravitational Wave and Cosmology, in what was clearly stated that they could not be of uh, astrophysical origin and demonstrated. But in that same book, we started to analyze binary neutron star and binary system. And, uh, and we had, uh, we worked, uh, the time at Princeton was incredible, the amount of hours we were working, something like 15, 16 hours a day. I mean, it was incredible. And in those days, in Princeton, there was a scientist from Brazil, Jay Metiomno. And with Frank Zerilli, but this is another part of the story, uh, we um, studied what, in our opinion, should be promising. Namely, we, we had the fortune in Princeton to have uh, Tullio Regge there, who had developed the perturbation tensorial analysis of the Schwarzschild solution, a fantastic mathematician, physicist, Frank Zerilli, and Jay Metiomno came in, in presenting the possibility to make the Fourier transform of our analysis, which have been done in the real time. And we predicted, therefore, a structure of a burst in this classic paper of a burst of a particle falling inside a black hole. I was asked some of you, Narayan, Spy, is that clear what I, I show? This is the ringing, the, the spike, and so forth. And then, of course, you have the binary on this. And uh, we had an idea with Wheeler, which was very exciting, that you could have uh, a pancake breaking into black holes and so forth, and then leading. Okay, uh, as you know from, the, from everywhere, I mean, it's incredible to me, but still, I can hear noise all over the planet. Even uh, school children in New Zealand who were uh, uh, supposed to mimic uh, high school student of this event. I mean, I mean TV, Tim, never seen such a thing. Anyway, uh, you have seen the uh, LIGO and uh, 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 experiment purported. Well, I missed just the keep figure, but it's no matter. Well, anyway, if you look at our, we have a paper on this, and which is still fighting for publication, but uh, which has been accepted now by the community of LIGO, which has incorporated our paper, not published, but incorporated kindly in their uh, view. I should be the happiest person in the world uh, because my theory with Tiomno has been proved to apply with 1% accuracy. And I can tell, in the Wigner sense, very interesting, even very, very interesting, but in the Wigner sense to add, if true. I think time will tell us if we are in presence 
of uh, it will it is anyway whatever the answer will be a very memorable result for the positive or negative the thing has acquired such an authority that in no matter will be very remarkable and noteworthy but um, I want to say also that the relativity has given us the possibility, thanks to Einstein, to understand the nature, to an incredible extent. This is a beautiful picture of the observation of cluster of galaxies in which you see the supernova uh, amplified by the work of Rosati, by, an, uh, 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 by another galaxy. In term, I mean, it's incredible. Everything uh, starts to be strange. Uh, this is the, on the wall the picture of uh, in Rome, the universe looking at itself and taking conscience. Willer did not get the Nobel Prize, or the downstairs, but Ricardo, who got the Nobel Prize after, said, well, but if you put in the eye the telescope of uh, Einstein telescope, you can see much better. <laughs> anyway, I would like to thank all the undergraduate, which used and postdoc researchers, among them all of the following, which are participating in this adventure, and also maybe close in honor of Mexico, one minute to the end, Einstein, Eisenberg, and Fermi and constituido la estructura conceptual portante que ha han alcanzado su máximo desarrollo en la astrofísica relativística, que no solo ha ampliado el conocimiento al entero universo, sino que, sino que más aún ahora usa el universo mismo como instrumento de medida sobre la base de las ecuaciones de Einstein. Questions? Okay. Uh, uh, the, my question is if uh, these gamma ray bursts uh, are in, uh, or could be important in the origin of life. Of la life. life. Of course. In, uh, in this vision, they are fundamental because the, not in the formation of the DNA, but in the evolution of the DNA are certainly fundamental. We have presented uh, this idea with P. Sin Chen, and uh, a lot, a lot more work is needed. We just made a proposal, rudimentary. But clearly, the, the role of GRB and supernova is recognized that is very fundamental to the, to the structure and the, the, the changes in the structure of the, of, the, of the DNA. And therefore, without this, uh, I was brought to this by a meeting like one of today in which there was a great biologist speaking before me. And he was mentioning how the evolution of the species can be followed now with the genome very accurately. I said, you convinced me, but you missed the point that radiation has certainly played a fundamental role into driving the genetic changes. <coughs> In a certain sense, the GRB must have the function of the strongest changes, most epochal, most powerful. But at the same time, they are intervening all over the universe, from the early stages 
to today. Therefore, if they exist in the beginning, very close to the beginning of the universe, in my opinion, it means that they are needed there. <laughs> and therefore, you, need, you have the presence of life there too. But this is just philosophical. The only thing I can say is that we, we can study the, the radiation in, now also in the JEV and not only in the, GR, the gamma and in the X. But they are fantastic machine, and it's not one GRB. Once that we understand the time scale involved, it's like if one board person said, time is short. What means short? Short with respect to what? If you have beta decays, 10 minus 21 seconds. Less than 10 minus 20 seconds is short. More is long. But if you see 100 seconds, if you don't understand the physics underground, it doesn't mean anything. Therefore, psychologically, the astronomers have said, well, it's short, it's energetic, then it's simple. No! Once you study with general relativity, you have the machine, the conceptual understanding, and this system evolves in a scenario, like I said in the abstract, not in the GRP simple. But you need to be prepared to that. And in my opinion, the major difficulty will come with the astronomers. And this is the reason of relativistic astrophysics, if I may spend a word on our PhD program. The point is, the astronomer today, in a large part of the world, go to study astronomy, being educated very strongly with the machinery of electronics analysis and so forth, but very little on the conceptual basis. We don't have enough knowledge on general relativity, on fundamental interaction in the astronomer. The astronomer like to go to the telescope, look again and again and again at the same object, maybe evolving, but it's not ready like uh, very intelligent people like Segre was not ready to accept that the proton, the electron, and the neutrino could come out of the neutron. The general astronomer will find it incredibly difficult to agree that in the GRB you have a supernova and a neutron star giving origin to two different objects within 100 seconds, namely a black hole and a different neutron star. It will be very difficult for him to understand this. And it will be very difficult because the average astronomer is today educated just in data analysis, like the Fermi people did on the, on the data analysis of Fermi, without effort in understanding the theory. Fortunately, general relativity, Einstein, Fermi theory, uh, Heisenberg theory are there. And therefore, we are not living in the nowhere. It will take time. It will take education. And I hope very much that also in this effort, uh, Mexico could participate in our IRA PhD and in ICRANET. We are a small group, but a small group caring about a very fundamental aspect in a time in which uh, people just uh, look, compute, chi-square, and, uh, and then, of course, they, they, <laughs> they cannot produce anything. One of our next papers is exactly to take an approach like chi-square, blah, 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 and then see, if you think about okay, you will see this in a you will see this in one month if you see that spike if you see that spike it means a lot. <laughs> but you need to understand why it, 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 it means a lot. Why this is precisely the key point which can be explained in the induced gravitational collapse. 
And for that, I hope very much to have more of uh, people, young people, participate in the Arab PhD. I will leave with uh, uh, Alfredo some of the posters. We will be. We have some students from Mexico. We would like to have more, but I call on uh, Professor Rodriguez to be one of the paladin to have the presence of uh, Ikrenet into Mexico. I will meet the Italian ambassador later on today, and I plan to speak with him about this. Thank you. I think that the observers in the room would like to know if your group or the many groups favoring the JET interpretation of GRBs, have these groups published papers giving us observers clues on what to look for and, and, this, and favor one of these two uh, viewpoints? Okay. One of the big disputes with the one of the <laughs> referees was about this picture. And my point is, if you take the data from Fermi and you put together X-ray, gamma rays, high energy, and you try to explain this within power law and so forth, you never understand. You, ne you need, first of all, as gen a special and general relativity tells you, make a space-time diagram and then to localize signal, signal going near to the speed of light and the signal going with the speed of light and uh, try nearly the speed of light, this red, this going to the speed of light <laughs> and see when they arrive and localize them in the source. This object is uh, an object going at gamma, uh, roughly, represented more than uh, 300, 400. And then it radiates, and you are seeing it. But this, no. Therefore, one of the key points of all the work of the last, uh, from the first, the, uh, fantastic date of LAT, fantastic, they discovered the JEV. All of them, I can ask Narayan to check, please, all of them assume that the JEV radiation comes together with the water radiation. Now, you can do whatever you like. You can put chi-square, power, or whatever. Ridiculous, because they don't come. They, they are different components. And Moreover, uh, this is an example, but there are many more examples. The beauty of the JEV emission is that is, uh, maybe you asked last time about the, the beaming. Uh, somebody here asked about the beaming. The beaming exists, but not in the X, in the gamma, only the JEV. And it's not as dramatic as they thought. But this shows that uh, <laughs> if you look at the set of paper which methodically assumed that all this should be treated on the same foot, forget about it. Out. And this does not come from the uh, intelligence that analysis intent. No, 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 it's conceptually wrong. This is the point I'm insisting different from particle physicists, where there is no a background theory, or very rudimentary, and they keep going with chi-square and so forth, general relativity, relativistic astrophysics, I repeat, relativistic astrophysics, has the enormous advantage to be able to approach a new system and understanding the time scale of the system and the physics and the the physical nature, but it's needed education. It's needed the course in general relativity, in, uh, in quantum field theory and so forth. What we don't need a large number, enormous number of people, but we need to have at least some people 
educated to lead this research and other research. Because I'm afraid that otherwise science based on the machine, computer, chi square is going to enter in a dramatic crisis. Not to be able to understand what is good for. Let me touch on this point, just what is good for, well, we can understand maybe even the role of biology, but we can understand the GRB. And we understand that the GRB radiation means the birth of the black hole. Fantastic. But in other field of physics, well, they found some object, but it's not clear how this object fits in the reality. Okay, last question. I would like to yes. go back to the idea of Gamma and uh, <laughs> at the Casino da Orca, Gamma and Schoenberg, where they understood the role of neutrino for supernova. Please. Okay. In, in uh, elementary particle physics, time scales are related via the Inconsci relation to masses of interacting particles to interaction distances. Are there similar relations in your binary star scenario? Similar scenario as what? You, 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 you see, if you think of the old Yukawa model of, of, of the nuclear forces, then you can relate the, the interaction distances of, of nuclear forces to the mass of, 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 of the mesons. Yes. And, 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 and here, in also with the vector mesons, the time scale associated with the beta decay is associated with the mass of the vector mesons. And the question is whether this 100 seconds are related to something similar. Can yes. you establish such a co correspondence or is this a wrong correspondence? I, I get. Thank you for this question. Uh, I try, I have not, I, uh, uh, okay. I think the concept of matrix as matrix has been essential in order to understand the in-state and the out-state. And they are a huge amount of work about this quantum characteristic of the time of the, of the transition. One of the most fundamental, okay, let's go to the fundamental. One of the most fundamental issue I had was in Brazil at a meeting in which a 17-year-old uh, asked a question. And he said, what about reversibility? I was shocked about the depth of such a question. The, as, the cosmic matrix which we are speaking about is not a quantum, but is a classical system in general relativity. And, such, and as such, while the plus e minus and the mu plus mu minus you can interpret symmetrically, and they are time reversible, the process, the formation of a black hole is certainly not time reversible. Okay? Therefore, you cannot take the cosmic matrix and reverse the cosmic matrix. But the only thing you can do is to have the in-state and out-state concept of Wheeler and Heisenberg implemented. The transition will not be quantum, but will be real. Now, if you compute the time scale of the accretion, and believe me, everything is being done. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to leave you with the impression each one of these paper is fantastically complex, tested with uh, uh, the people at Los Alamos and so forth. In this accretion, uh, hypercritical accretion, you can compute the time scale of a few seconds. Therefore, this 100 second total can be split into accretion, neutrino emission, E plus, E minus, in all details. And you have the transition from one state 
to the other state. The reformed answer is yes, but don't expect, and this is very deep, that the system be symmetric, time symmetric is not. And don't expect a quantum just by, uh, is deterministic. But the concept of trans, or in, out state is there. Is clear? And, and it's helpful. And I take this as an example. Everything is computable, but an example for astronomer to start to look at this understanding. <laughs> Stop saying short because it's one second or uh, uh, up to 100 seconds. No, this is meaningless. Answer? Convinced? Good. Okay, we thank Raymond for his interesting talk. <laughs> now we have a 12 minutes coffee break and then we split and begin with the symposium. Thank you.